Uh, well, thank you very much, and thank you to the people in the in the basement as well. Um, nice to see you. I, I'm assuming they're actually there, and it's not just a camera that makes me feel like there's more people than really are here. But thank you. Uh, and, um, I thought I'd embark on a, a fairly risky approach this evening. It's the end of a long day um, for all of you and for me, I think. So I thought I would try and do a load of live demonstrations, and. Um, that's risky because uh, when we arrived to set up, we couldn't get any of the Wi-Fi things to connect to anything, so they will probably all fail. If they'll fail, I'll take a lot of questions, uh, and we'll, we'll all go home early. Um, is that okay? Um, now, uh, picking up the theme from David about how do we think about innovation at the point of service, I think there are two words that um, I want to uh, leave etched in your minds from my talk, uh, the words fast and the word happy. Now, fast might not work through my live demos if everything fails, but I'm going to try and do happy. But I think I better do happy now rather than at the end of it, in case you're not happy at the end. So I'd like this is the one bit of audience participation. I'd like you, if you can, all to look very happy. Wave your hands, smile, and just look happy. Can you do that for me? <laughs> I'm going to take, well, every, see if I can get everybody in. Well, uh, there, OK, great. Some very good looking people in the front row here. Uh, OK, thank you very much, everybody. That's good. So um, we'll come back to that in a second. Fast and happy. Fast and happy. Let me, um, let me just uh, show you a website. So there's one. Oh, God. Uh, there's another one. There's a website. OK, so this, uh, this is the Google website. Hopefully, you're familiar with uh, Google. Um, thank you if you are. Um, so I'm going to talk about Google. I'm going to illustrate uh, the way we think about engineering, um, how we try to think about making users happy by doing things fast, and how we put those two things together. There's a second set of things we put together, uh, um, or we're trying to put together at the moment, which is the internet and the real world. So I, um, we do a lot of talking to businesses and marketeers at Google. And um, a couple of years ago, uh, we had a session with a load of senior marketing people from all around Europe. I'm sure they've been to business schools not quite as good as this one. And um, we're having a big discussion about the changing nature of marketing. And uh, as a little bit of an interlude, we got one of the guys who's um, become a star of YouTube to come and talk to them. There's a guy called Charlie McDonald. Anybody know Charlie is so cool like? Anybody? This guy has got 80 or 90 million video views on YouTube. He's a now 21-year-old from Bath. And um, he, he makes great little videos. And there's a really good one. He does little songs. Um, one of his songs is called Acne. Um, I would recommend him uh, to you if you haven't seen him. I can show him in a minute if everything else fails. Um, and uh, Charlie got up on stage. And he's, you know, we're all talking about marketing and how you do different things, types of marketing and business in the digital world. And he said, look. Um, I just don't understand why people older than me think the internet and the real world are two different places. The internet and the real world are the same place. And um, a lot of what's happening now, I think, is the bringing together of the internet and the physical world. And we'll talk about that. And I'll try and illustrate it. So let me get to the first of my demos. This is something that we're immensely proud of at Google. And um, you may or may not like it. So it's this. It's, the <laughs> it's a fact. Look at how sunny it's going to be in London. <laughs> um, can you see this OK? It's a little bit uh, washed out. But um, when you type a couple of letters, we are immediately trying to find and give you the results page we think you're looking for, fast and hopefully happy. So we know that in the UK, if you type we, you're most likely to be interested in weather. Uh, in the UK, uh, we're obsessed with the weather, largely because it's never like that. Um, but in order to do that, uh, we had to do a lot of engineering. So let me take you back to the beginning of internet search. and. Um, sort of 12, 13 years ago, 13 years ago this year, Google was founded. And at that time, Yahoo was manually indexing the web. Now, manually indexing the web basically means reading pages and kind of typing in, that's a page about yachts, that's a page about gardening, that's a page about adult entertainment. Um, many of the pages were about that in those days. And um, Google came along, and it was a, basically a maths project. And it was a maths project about using technology to understand language and uh, index pages and looking at patterns of usage and patterns of links between pages to try to understand what you were looking for. Um, and uh, so that was you know, the technology underpinning Google. And obviously, the web took off explosively in terms of the volume of pages. If you come through to um, uh, 2001 and the 9-11 attacks, at that time, uh, what our engineers observed, there were lots of people looking on Google for up-to-the-minute news stories, unsurprisingly, given those events. And um, uh, they realized that our web search was not up to it, because we weren't updating 
or the website content fast enough. So they built Google News. And Google News was um, focused on a smaller number of websites that are updating much more frequently. There are accred accredited news websites. And so fast and happy, uh, we were able to try to give people more up-to-the-minute results on those sites. You come forward to today, pretty much every website is updated very frequently. We're all blogging, we're all tweeting, we're all uh, posting customer reviews on not just Amazon now, but more and more and more websites. So the web has become much bigger, a trillion plus URLs on the web. It's become much more frequently updated, uh, and it's become much richer. It's not just text anymore. And so we rebuilt all of our architecture behind web search in order to crawl the web faster to understand these different types of media. And then um, and that didn't look any different to the user. And then what we've done is we've used that to uh, allow us to do things like this, to predict what you're looking for and give you the results faster. And we know that you know, literally a tenth of a second, even a couple of hundredths of a second, makes a difference to our users. So the faster we are, the more frequently people come back and the more people search. The faster we get you off our website to what you're looking for, uh, the happier you are. The better it is for the website owner that you're looking for, because they're, fine, you're, they're being found earlier. And the better it is for us, because people come back more often, and that gives us a chance to build a brand and build a business. So um, we're really proud of that. Um, if I move on from there, let's, let's take another couple of things. What do you think T does? Anybody? What, what do you think T would bring up? Transport. Transport. TFL is in there. Well done. Tesco, actually. <laughs> TO, Top Shop, Toys R Us, Top Man. We are a nation of shoppers in the UK. Um, Actually, we're a nation of digital shoppers as well. You know, we are the country in the world with the biggest per capita spend on e-commerce. So it's pretty impressive, isn't it? We like shopping. We like buying things online. Um, and that's one of the reasons why it's become our biggest market outside uh, the US as well, actually, because of that e-commerce spend, marketing spend follows e-commerce spend. Um, actually, typing these things reminded me, it's my brother's birthday uh, tomorrow, and he's a Spurs fan. So let me just have a look at oh, Tottenham. So, so there you go, fast and happy. Not only are we um, bringing up, we're probably looking for Tottenham, which is a football team. You might want to go through the um, detail of some of these pages, or you might just want to know what do they, how do they do in the last game and what's coming up next. So we'll sometimes give you, as we did with the weather, um, just the snippet of information you're probably looking for right there on the page. Fast and happy. Uh, or not, if you're a Fulham fan. Um, and that's reminded me, what I need to do, actually, is buy him... Um, buy him a, 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 a present. So I'm going to try and see if I can buy him a a shirt from Tottenham Spurs, they're known as. And so I've looked that for, uh, there you can see I've got some results on Spurs. I noticed I've mistyped that, apologies. Um, I didn't mean to type by Spurs shitter. Um, maybe it was sub subliminal. Um, but uh, but um, if you can't spell, that's our problem. Right? If you can't type, it's our problem. We, our engineers want to make it easy for you to get the right answer. So you'll often notice that you mistype things, and we notice the common mistypings because lots of people are using the search engine, and we try to figure out what people are actually looking for. So you're, you know, we were right on that occasion. I was actually looking for buy a Spurs shirt rather than uh, the other thing that I typed. So um, hopefully that's giving you an, a glimpse into the, some of the ways we're thinking about um, technology and constantly improving things for consumers. The point about innovation at the point of service, we test everything all the time. So um, if you think about a company like Amazon, I brought their web page up earlier, there's Amazon. If you land on Amazon's web page, uh, one user landing will see a different configuration of things. Let's see if this works now. Uh, from the next user landing, I'm not sure if it's changing or not, so I can't tell you. If I'm just refreshing the page. So sometimes you can see this uh, on page refresh. Uh, here we go. Do you see that changing? So each person landing is getting a different configuration of offers and pricing and so on. They're testing up to 200 different things at any one time to optimize their website. Go back to Google. Um, we test everything all the time. 1% of users will see something different. We'll see what the behavior is, and we'll improve what we're doing. The web allows you to experiment very fast and get real-time feedback and improve what you're doing. That's one of the key things about service and product uh, development on the web, um, that traditional businesses are really slowly starting to get a handle on. Another example, this shade of blue. I have an engineer who's totally religious about testing. And um, he suggested we test different shades of blue. He tested 40 different shades of blue to see whether there was one that would allow users to click through fractionally faster. Fast is good. Fast is happy. And there was. Fractions of a second. There's a shade of blue that's a faster shade. And um, so we implemented it. Because if we can shave fractions of a second off billions of searches, that's good for everybody. Um, and so we really take that sort of stuff um, very seriously. Uh, what else? Well, crawling the web and looking at all this technology uh, looking at all this uh, text, sorry, has allowed us to understand language quite well. So um, 
I was in Germany last week, and uh, they have a newspaper called Allgemeine Zeitung. Um, and uh, let me just have a look at their website and see what's going on in, uh, in Germany at the moment. So there's the, there's the Allgemeine Zeitung website. Now, being uh, British, I don't understand any other languages. And um, fortunately, um, Chrome, which is the Google browser here, has given me the option to translate the page. It's recognized it's in German, and it's recognized that I've been doing English things. So if I click Translate, what we're doing is going to our huge database of understanding text in different languages and trying to match things together. And so, now it's not going to be perfect, but shots on bus in Niederholm were probably only dumber boy prank. That's probably something that you can understand. And actually, when you try reading this sort of stuff, it's not perfect, but it gives you a pretty good understanding of what's going on. This is a huge opportunity. Um, lots of businesses now are using this kind of technology to translate their websites in order to sell products and services around the world. It's a big driver of export. In the UK, we're a big net M importer in our overall economy. Uh, in e-commerce, uh, we export three times more than we import. Okay. This is a big, big opportunity. So we can translate things. Um, uh, what else do we do uh, with this stuff? Well, um, we can look for places. So if I go, um, go back to Google, uh, let's say I'm looking for London hotels. There's a bunch of hotels in London here. Um, you, know, you can scroll down and look for what they are. That's what people are doing all the time. Um, just seeing, is there one with a phone number? Okay, so there's some phone numbers here. Now, has anybody ever been in a situation where you've looked for something on the web, you've found a phone number, you've written it on a post-it note, and you've stuck it to the back of your phone? Yeah? So a good example of how our engineers work, um, a friend of mine, Dave Burke, is our engineering director in London. And he observed this, and he... Um, decided he was going to try and fix it. So on a flight to Singapore, Singapore, he hacked together some code for something called Chrome to Phone. And Chrome to Phone is a little program. I don't know if you can see it up here. Yeah, can you see that little yellow arrow and a phone symbol? It's a little pro program called an extension, which you just in install into your web browser. It takes less than 30 seconds to install. And what it allows you to do is connect your phone and your desktop. So haha, we'll see if this works. It's been very slow. Um, what I'm going to do is show you. This is my phone. Um, it actually is my phone, so that's probably why it's not working quite as well as it should do. Um, and uh, I'm logged into my phone, and I'm logged into the browser here. This won't work. Um, but if I click the Chrome to Phone sign, when I've highlighted a phone number, here's the idea. Let's see if this will work. This might be the least impressive demonstration you've ever seen. Um, so what it's doing is I've logged into the browser, and it said I'm sent, uh, it's sent to the phone, and hopefully... At some point, it could well be in 20 minutes' time, it will show up uh, on my phone and allow me to dial it. So I'm going to try to do some demonstrations on the phone. It looks like it's not going to be my night. Um, and we'll see how they go. Okay, so let, let me turn to the phone and see um, what's happening. Because uh, the internet revolution on the desktop, I think we all sort of understand, there are 2 billion people using computers to connect to the internet around the world. But there are 4 to 5 billion people using mobile phones around the world. And when people move to a mobile phone as the way they access the internet, their, their phone behavior changes fundamentally. So um, we know that if you move from a high-end phone like a BlackBerry with a 3G connection to something like an iPhone or an Android phone, your uh, use of the web goes up 30 to 50 times. And over the next three years, we'll go from having 2 billion people online to 4 billion, 5 billion in 2015, 2016. Most of those people will be in Asia. Um, and for many of them, the way to connect to the internet will be only via a mobile device. So we're just at the beginning of um, a revolution here. Um, so let me sort of try and show you some of the things you can do on uh, the mobile phone. Um, now, like the desktop where I can't type very well, the mobile phone's a disaster for me. I've got fat fingers, which I should have had manicured, I noticed. <laughs> um, uh, but so hopefully, um, what I can do is, here's, so here's Google website. Now, a lot of people think about mobile phones and the internet and think about apps. Have you got apps on their phones? Yeah. Um, you can do lots with apps, but apps are just really little front ends for websites. And actually, there's a huge amount on the web. And now, web use on the phone is overtaking the use of apps on the phone. So this is Google on a website on the phone. And um, what I do, you can see it recognizes. Firstly, it recognizes where I am. And it recognizes I'm on a mobile. And so it's giving me these buttons. Because quite often when you're on a mobile, you're looking for one of these things. So let's say we're looking for a, a restaurant. So hopefully, uh, yeah, there we go. Um, hopefully there's some restaurants in the area because it knows where I am. So the first thing I've done is just tapped one tap, and it's finding me restaurants near where I am. And then as I can scroll down through this restaurants, you can see that it's highlighting the restaurant, and it's also showing me an image to do with the restaurant um, as I scroll through the list. There's a photograph. So it's helping me to find 
nearby restaurants and showing them relative to where I am on the map. That's quite handy. And so I can say, oh, Petrus, I've heard of that. Anybody been there? Is it good? It's quite posh. So I can give them a call. Um, second tap, and I can call them. So uh, no typing, just because of the device and the computing um, power that's in the device, and the fact I've given it permission to know where I am and use that. Um, I can tap once, flick up and down, tap twice, and I'm booked a table at Petrus. Probably not. Probably too posh uh, to let me in. Um, so fast and happy, and that's all done in the browser, not an app at all. Very, very fast. And um, I think that's one of the ways in which we'll see people innovating a lot. How many people have bought something uh, using their mobile phone, bought something on the web using their mobile phone? Yeah? Hand up if you bought something over 50 quid. A few people? Uh, bigger, what have you bought? Anybody like to tell us? Train tickets. Train tickets, more, definitely more than 50 quid. Other items? Yes, camera. Camera, uh, what, sorry, a plane? Yeah. A flight. <laughs> Yeah, so people are buying big ticket items on their mobile phones. Actually, eBay are selling, I can't remember whether it's two or three Ferraris a month on mobile phones. <laughs> and it sounds incredible. And actually, uh, so two, two qualifiers on that. Firstly, um, uh, it's not always a Ferrari, but it's an equivalently priced car. And secondly, um, of course, what's happening on eBay is you're bidding. And so the way you want to keep control of your bidding is having a device that's right on you all the time. So it's a bit less surprising. But, you know, Marks and Spencers are selling sofas on mobile phones. Many airlines are selling flights on mobile phones. Actually, the mobile phone customer is more valuable because they tend to be booking later. And then you can charge them more. So, you know, different use cases. We also know at Google that on the desktop, um, what is it, 20% of searches on the desktop have a local um, angle to them. And on the mobile, it's 40%. So, you know, mobile is much more about get me stuff near me. So let's see what else I can show you on mobile. So that's just looking at uh, websites. Um, you've obviously got a speaker on a phone because it's for speaking in. So you can um, hopefully use that to uh, do some uh, useful things. So let's try and see if we can get this to work. Pictures of black Mark Jacobs handbags. This could be a long wait. But what I'd like to show you is that um, when I talk to the phone, it records a file of my voice. It sends that file, if the connection works, to the internet. Ah, there we go. Now, normally that happens like that. So apologies, because the connection's not working for me very well. Um, but so the voice file goes to a server on the internet. That server distributes it to loads of our other servers. They all decide what they think the voice actually said, send it back to the central server, which looks at the votes and sends back the best guess at the answer. And then we run a web search and send back the results pretty fast. And it's because you're con combining the power of the internet's computing with um, a smaller computer on your phone. And actually, the phone's not doing anything very smart. It's all done in the cloud. Now, what's also smart is if the ladies among us will know that Mark Jacobs, in the context of handbags, is spelled with a C. So we know that because we know Mark Jacobs appearing with handbags tends to do that. And there are some pictures of Mark Jacobs' handbags. Now, my wife particularly likes handbags. So this is quite useful for me, because I don't like to ask for advice in a shop, because I'm a man. And so I can go in and I can see, oh, yeah, that's what it is. Now, of course, you can do other things uh, which are useful. So actually, when I was looking at these handbags, I was, I was, in, um, I was in Spain. 3,000 euros in pounds. So you can also talk to your phone. Uh, anybody got an iPhone with a Siri? Is it, Apple's launched their new voice thing, which is similar to this kind of stuff, I think. Is it good? Yeah, it's, really, it's probably better than this. Um, 3,000 euros in pounds. There it is, coming via pigeon post. But... Um, Again, as with the desktop, we're giving you not just the, the links, but actually the result, fast and happy. You think about it, when you're out, you know, when you most need a currency translation, uh, you almost never have the means of getting one, but now you can. And you can find out that the handbag is nearly 2,600 pounds. You might want to save up a bit more uh, for that. Fast and happy. Um, then we go into, well, you saw the translation on the desktop. How can you do translation on a phone? Again, this might be a little bit slow. So this is Google Translate. How much is that handbag? Suspense, isn't it? Is it going to work? Probably not. The translation, how much is the handbag? Cuanto es el bolso. Anybody Spanish? Is that right? That's correct. That's correct. How was my accent, sir? <laughs> Lousy. <laughs> Wouldn't it be great if I could get the uh, phone to, to speak that out loud? I wonder what the little loudspeaker button does there. ¿Cuánto es el bolso? How's that? 
better. <laughs> Good. So, um, and actually I won't demonstrate it now because of the slowness, but um, at the bottom you can see the enter conversation mode. You remember in Star Trek when they could talk in Californian to everybody? Yeah? It's here. You can actually stand over this phone and one person can speak in Spanish and the other in English and the phone will speak back in the other language. Yeah? It, works, it, it works surprisingly well. I won't demonstrate it here because of the speed, but um, it works surprisingly well. How are we doing for time? Okay, good. Faster, faster. Um, happy, good. So, uh, we haven't typed anything on the phone. We've just used um, a couple of taps based on the context of understanding what I'm doing, and we've used the voice, um, which is pretty powerful, linking to the entire computing power of the internet. Um, but your phone's also got other stuff, hasn't it? It's got camera. So let's have a look at the camera on the phone. How can you use the camera? Well, we've got um, a little application called Google Goggles. Anybody heard of that? Yeah. Uh, it's basically starting to use the phone's camera as an input to search. And it's, it's reasonably good at um, landmarks. So I tried it on the Colosseum the other day. It worked quite well. Could tell it was a Colosseum. Um, but so could I. Um, it's also uh, somewhat good at products. So let's see if we can get it to work on a... Um, let's, well, actually, uh, before I do that, let me show you... One of the things we're experimenting with goggles is trying to make everything connected to the internet. So this is a badly photocopied ad um, which we ran with Buick in the US, and we're doing some of this in the UK now, uh, with a little Google Goggles logo on the bottom. So the idea of that is if you fire up Google Goggles, I'm going to use that to take a photograph of this ad. I might not be able to do it on here because of the shadow, but let's just see if I can. Yeah, I don't think it's going to get the camera. Oh, there we go. Right, so I'm taking the photograph. You can see that it's analysed the photograph. It's getting faster. And it's spotted that it's a Buick Lacrosse ad. If I click that, but it's getting very fast now. Um, I'm straight away through to an interactive website with videos and demos, and I can book a test drive. So I've suddenly turned a dying dead paper, a dead trees medium, into something that's interactive. You know, that's worth a lot to the consumer because of the value, but it's actually worth a huge amount to the publishing industry as well, because suddenly they can prove you know, the advertising works or not. So that's, you know, that's starting to make everything connectable to the internet. So that's goggles. Now, um, Another thing we can do with that technology, and some people have started to do this uh, commercially, is we can build it into a shopping application. So this is a Google Shopper, but Ocado use our technology uh, that we've built into Android to do this in their shopping app. And Tesco do the same, so that you can use voice and you can use barcode scanning and you can actually photograph products. So I've got a product here. This is a, I've never read this book, but I don't know where I got it from, actually. Anybody read this? About a man and wife, Tony Parsons. No. Somebody at the back, hello, camera person's read it. Any good? OK, great. So what if we wanted to buy this book on your recommendation? Well, I often sort of get a recommendation and forget about it. But actually, if you use something like this, you can click the photograph button. And hopefully, uh, the contrast is really bad. Let's see if I can get that to work. I think the lighting's screwing up here. Let me just try this out of the bright light, so. We may have to go with your recommendation on the way this is working. OK, here we go. So what that's done is using, just using the photograph, it's identified uh, the book. Actually, for some reason, it hasn't linked to others. But generally, you can get connections to online and offline merchants using that. So it's not even using a barcode. It's just identifying from the jacket of the book, using all the content on the internet. So there's another application of this. My favorite application is one um, that is more of a bit of fun. But it demonstrates how using visual using the computing power of the internet and returning results in a, contextual, in a contextually appropriate fashion uh, is going to take off. Anybody do Sudoku? Yeah? My mother-in-law does Sudoku. I love my mother-in-law. Um, and she hates me for this. I'll show you this. So I tried to do Sudoku. I found it really hard. I've never actually completed one. Here's a Sudoku from the back of the Guardian. And um, so if I, use, if I use goggles on this, I'm going to take the photograph. Oops. Everything's broken. I'm going to try again. I'm going to take a photograph of the Sudoku puzzle. I'm going to do it over here because of the light uh, using Google goggles. Right, I think that's got it. So what it's doing is it's trying to recognize what it is. It's got it as a Sudoku puzzle. And there it brings up the result. <laughs> you see that? So we see if it works. There we go. Yeah, almost a ripple of applause there. So um, it's, a, it's a bit of fun. 
I mean, but actually, it's beaten the world Sudoku champion. Um, <laughs> it's really demoralized a lot of people. Fast and un unhappy in the case of Sudoku. But the point being, um, using a camera, using the computing power of the web, but then returning a result in a way that's useful uh, based on the nature of the photograph in the first place. So I don't know where that's going to take us, but that's really interesting technology, I think, to be able to see. Okay, uh, what else? Uh, I think we're getting towards the end of the uh, session because I, my, my luck is going to run out at some point. Um, other things you can do. Um, now, I've got a demo thing here, which is... Uh, there's an ad here. Um, it shouldn't really be in a magazine. This is more for a point of sale or an outdoor ad. Uh, so what we've got in phones these days is NFC, near field communication chips. Quite a lot of phones being sold have these. These are the kinds of technology that you use when you use your Oyster card, tap and pay. And so my phone's got uh, this technology in. So here's an ad uh, for um, L'Oreal. Uh, there we go. So I've just literally just put the phone on the ad and I've got straight through to the website with rich media content about the, in this case, Million Lashes Mascara. But if you think about that, what I've shown you, everything that you can say, everything that you can type, everything that you can tap, everything that you can photograph can be connected to the internet. And not just the information on the internet, but the computing power of the internet and all of your friends, family, and other people on the internet who might have a point of view on what you're doing. So this is you know, quite transformational stuff. So the collision that Charlie is so cool like was talking about between the digital world and the real world is here and now. And this is available in millions of phones that are being sold. I just want to finish, I think, by going back to the desktop, because I think we've been lucky with the phone, um, and just show you a couple of things which are useful to businesses, since you're in a business school. Um, so uh, let me take you to, uh, let's, have a look. So let's take you to Google for a second. Um, if I were to search for, uh, let's go to this, Tartan, okay, there's a company here called Scott Webb, and uh, I met the guy who started Scott Webb. Scott Webb uh, sells tartan and kilts and sporrans, these are traditional Scottish uh, uh, items, and they had a, a shop in Edinburgh, and um, actually it's quite challenging to sell a lot of volume. Uh, because you have to rely on people going past wanting to buy Scottish things, and Edinburgh's not a bad place to go for that, but once you've sold to a bunch of people in Edinburgh, it's quite hard to grow your market. You know, if you send um, a load of flyers out to people, not many of them are going to get the flyer at the point at which they want to buy a kilt, and many of them don't want to buy a kilt. So traditional marketing doesn't work very well. But of course, with Google, they can appear anywhere in the world, anyone, anywhere, anytime somebody types tartan or kilt or sporran. It's a great website. You can actually design your own tartan. And um, so the guys, uh, who founded the company, this is Nick Fitters here, who, uh, who I was talking about, 70% um, of their sales now come from outside the UK, from outside Scotland, actually. Um, and so that's some, an ex one example of millions of small businesses that are um, exploiting the web in this way. And the UK is good at this stuff. Uh, as I said, we're big net exporters online, and small businesses are growing faster than large, bus large businesses in terms of their e-commerce sales. So you know, this is an interesting... Uh, example and one which inspired us actually to build a tool that might help other small businesses. So um, I'm going to show you two tools and then I'm going to stop. The first is um, uh, Global Market Finder and it's free. And what we do here is it's using the power of Google Translate. I'm just going to set it up. So let's imagine we are in the United Kingdom. Let's imagine we're interested in people typing kilt, tartan, <laughs> and Sporan. And, oh God, I've got to type this thing. What the hell does that say anyway? T-A-T-Y-L-E-A-T, Find opportunity. So what we're doing here is we're trying to um, go and look at where in the world are people searching for those words, uh, what's the volume of searches that we see on Google. Uh, if you wanted to advertise on those, what would we suggest you bid to be on the front page? And how com competitive is the advertising auction that we run in those markets. So you can very quickly, in seconds, get a field a fix on where you could go. And you can't see it that well, but if you were to say, well, look, you know, Japan, that's quite interesting. Quite a lot of searches, not hugely competitive. You can then open up and see, in Japanese, what are the words that people are typing. So this is built on Google Translate. So lots of the things we're doing are building on other technologies. So, you know, remember, Translate came from web crawling. And then we're putting that together with search data and looking at the patterns. So that's an opportunity for businesses very quickly to go and test and learn from uh, market opportunities, and many of them do. Um, and then the other tool I thought I'd show you is related to um, insights and trends about what people are searching for online. So anybody uh, know Mr. Bean? Yeah? You like Mr. Bean? 
Mr. Bean's amazingly popular around the world. Rowan Atkinson, the comedian, we seem to have lost the video, but uh, he, he does... Um, he does sort of visual comedy. Oh, okay, well, I'm going to play that. And there's an adver advertising there. How terrible. Um, so, Mr. Bean, wouldn't it be interesting if you're Rowan Atkinson to know whether you're continuing to be popular or not and where in the world you're popular? So, there's a tool here called uh, Insights for Search. This is available to anybody. And um, what it does is it allows you to look at trends in different words. So. I'm only going to do one example, but there are lots of examples you can try here. It's very good at predicting uh, the winner of the Eurovision Song Contest, and also elections, actually. Um, so if you do something, you can compare search terms, so you can look at uh, Clinton versus um, Obama and look at what happened over time historically and things like that. It's quite interesting. Um, but I'm just going to look at Mr. Bean, because I'm not interested in politics today. I've had enough of it. Um, so here we go. What this does is it tells me what's the trend in volume uh, of searches for Mr. Bean over time. You can barely see that. Can you see it on this one? No. People next door probably can't see it at all. But it basically, there's a line going up. Um, and uh, what we've done is we've taken out the growth of the internet. So it's indexed. So it's a proportion of searches in any given year. So there's a line going up, and it keeps going up. And they haven't made a lot of new content recently. So that's interesting if you own Mr. Bean. Uh, it would be really interesting to know where in the world it's popular. Where in the world is Mr. Bean disproportionately popular, do you think? Germany? Germany? Come on, business students. You must know the answer. Huh? Germany. I'm going to start cold calling. Is that what you do? Where else? Japan. Japan. Germany, Japan. Completely wrong. <laughs> Pakistan, Vietnam, Malaysia, Sri Lanka, Singapore, UAE. That's interesting. So obviously that's as a proportion of... Japanese people in those countries. It probably is. <laughs> yeah. Ever come across the problem of the highest paid person's opinion? So one of the things I like talking about with the internet is the fact that you know, if you've got an opinion from the CEO, uh, you can confound it by actually getting real data about what people are really doing. There's a great story. One, there's a well-known British telecommunications company. I won't mention who they are. And uh, they uh, were looking at what should they call their high-speed broadband product. And the two divisional chiefs went in. One had a load of ideas from the creative agency. You know, fantastic names. They were going to call it and how it's all going to look. The other one had a page of insights for search printouts saying people are searching for super-fast broadband. Why don't we call it that? Yeah, good idea. So, um, highest paid person's opinion versus the facts of millions of uh, people. So, coming back to this, um, what else would be interesting to know is what, when people search for Mr. Bean, what else do they search for? And down here, you get the related searches. So, Mr. Bean games. So, not only do you know that interest is going up in Mr. Bean, you know which countries you want to go and flog your DVDs and get the shows uh, sold to broadcasters and maybe relaunch the movies in, uh, but you also can see that you might have an opportunity to promote Mr. Bean games and also cartoons. And there's a lot of interest in YouTube, Mr. Bean, and then you saw the channel I showed you earlier. So that's a final example of how marketeers are putting all of that stuff uh, together. Now, the last thing I'd say is, um, you know, I started off by talking about the connection between the internet and the real world. And we've, we've seen the connection between the mobile and the internet devices. And I think one of the things that's happening now is we are getting used to using multiple screens. And we want all of our information on all the different places. So uh, if I go over here, um, this is... Um, Google Plus, which we launched recently. We're experimenting with looking at how you can share things. And uh, what you can see here is a photograph, uh, which hopefully we can recognize the people in it. Uh -huh. There we go. Can you see that? It's a very shakily taken photograph. Uh, but it's, uh, it's everybody here. That's cool. And so what I might do is just finish by sharing that with the world. Is anybody averse? <laughs> who's, who's told their partner that they're somewhere else this evening? <laughs> OK, if you're happy. So um, let's just. Fast and happy at Imperial. I can't type. Imperial. Okay, so I can publish that to the web. To the web. But what's happening there is my phone is automatically uploading all my photographs to my account. It's not sharing them. I can choose which ones to share, and I can also choose, by the way, who to share them with, which is quite important. Uh, and so I can share them just with a restricted group or with a larger group. But that is, again, about making it easy for me to manage all my things across all these different screens. I'm going to stop there. That was my quick foray into Fast and Happy. Thank you very much.